Hello and welcome to GameSack. This time around, we're pitting Capcom against Konami. I can't believe we're going right for the gusto with this one. Two of the biggest companies in gaming, and we're going to go head-to-head -head with them. And as you know, there can only be one winner. That's right. And we flipped a coin, and Dave goes first, and Dave is taking Konami. Konami was founded in 1969 by Kagemasa Kozuki as a jukebox rental and repair shop. The company's first foray in the video game market was with arcade games in the late 1970s. Frogger from 1981 was one of their first hits that helped the company realize the profitability of the video game market. It's a simple game that has you controlling frogs that need to cross a busy street. It was hugely addictive in that time. Konami has a rich history of quality arcade titles. They've released a ton of games over the years, and in the late 80s and early 90s, their go-to genres seem to be the beat-em-up. A lot of these are burned into our memories as some of the greatest experiences we've had in the arcade. Combined with Konami's love for licensing popular IPs, we got games like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, which was based on the TV show. This came as a two- or four-player cabinet. Each turtle used a signature weapon, but to me, it really didn't matter as they were all fun to play. Like I said, Konami had a ton of arcade beat-em-ups. Titles like Crime Fighters, X-Men, and Metamorphic Force, just to name a few. One of their more popular beat-em-ups was based on the TV show The Simpsons. This 1991 title came out at just the right time in the show's popularity and allowed up to four players to control Homer, Marge, Lisa, and Bart. They're also known for their other genres such as shooters. Games like Gradius, Thundercross, and Life Force are all awesomely fun shooters worthy of plopping many quarters into. And who could forget their run and gun games like Sunset Riders? There was just something about the cowboy and the Old West setting that really clicked with me on this one. Oh, and they also made a little game called Contra. You get to shoot down bad guy humans and bad guy aliens who are trying to take over the world. Want 30 lives to get through this one? No problem, just put in 10 quarters. Oops, the game won't let you continue that much, so you're screwed. And someone at Konami must have really liked these 3D stages, because a little over a year later they even tried to make a full game in that style with Devastators. This one had you running into the screen shooting down bad guys the entire time. They tried this formula again with G.I. Joe four years later. They even added a bit of crosshair action like Cabal or Wild Guns. The result is a much more fun and playable game than Devastators was. Overall, Konami's presence in the arcades was a strong one as they had tons of fantastic titles. In the 1980s, Konami started developing games for the home market. At first, they heavily developed games for the MSX computer systems. But by the late 80s, most of their development turned towards the Nintendo Famicom, also known as the Nintendo Entertainment System in the West. Many of their arcade games got home ports despite the much less powerful hardware. Some games, like Contra, are arguably much better than their arcade counterparts. It's longer, it plays better, and it just works better on a horizontally oriented screen rather than a vertical one. It was also one of the earliest games on the NES that allowed two players to play together at the same time in one action game. This is a tough title, but we do have the Konami code if you're so inclined. Yep, Konami is the company behind the most famous code in history. Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, start. Contra's first sequel, Super C, provided more outstanding Contra action and once again was a great port of the arcade. The next sequel, Contra Force, just couldn't live up to the predecessors. Even shooters like Gradius got ported home and turned out pretty well on the NES. There were a lot of one-hit wonders that could have been made into a series of their own. Titles like Bucky O'Hare, which was different from the arcade version. The Goonies 2, which could be described as an early Metroidvania without the Metroid or the Castlevania. And Jackal, which offered some cool jeep shooting action. And one of the greatest series in video gaming was also created by Konami. Of course, I'm talking about Castlevania. In the 8-bit era, Castlevania had three NES games, three Game Boy games, and an MSX2 title. When Castlevania 3 came out, I felt like I had died and gone to heaven. I was beyond happy that the developers went back to the playstyle of the first game with individual levels and no RPG elements. And Konami was known for good music, and they liked to push the edge of that with special sound chips in some of their games in Japan. The Japanese version of Castlevania 3, called Akumajo Densetsu, sounds much better than the US version, although both sound great. <laughs> Konami's 
Konami was even able to make sports games fun back in the day. Games like track and field is still even fun to play today. You compete in eight Olympic events. Button mashing is the key to a lot of these events as that's how you build your power meter. It doesn't take long to get the hang of the controls and before you know it, you're a digital Olympian. Blades of Steel was another fun sports game. This hockey game was easy to control and had some really cool features. For one, it had voices which was insanely rare on the NES at the time. <laughs> Secondly, you could fight. If you bother your opponent enough, a fight will break out. Konami wanted to release even more games, but in the 8-bit days, Nintendo of America had a ridiculous rule that developers could only release five games on the system per year. Konami didn't like this rule, so they released titles under another label called Ultra Games. This is how they brought some signature series over to the West, such as Metal Gear and others. The port of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles arcade game was also really well done. A whole new level was made for this game and the others were lengthened. And don't forget Operation C on the Game Boy, which was pretty good considering the hardware. Konami was certainly no slouch during the 8-bit generation, and they'd only go on to improve during the 16-bit era. Follow GameSack on Twitter at GameSack and at GameSack Dave on Instagram at GameSack Official and check out our Patreon if you want. Konami really came into their own when the 16-bit consoles were released. They were churning out quality titles left and right and for all systems. The Super Nintendo got fantastic sequels like Contra 3. This might just be the best one in the series. Gradius 3 was released early on and despite the slowdown it had good action and the outstanding music that Konami is known for. Super Castlevania 4 was another early release. This is a reboot of the first game and may just be my favorite Castlevania game ever. The Super Nintendo also got a great port of the second Turtles arcade game called Turtles in Time. And of course it's one of the best beat-em-ups on a home console to this day. And if you want more beat-em-ups, you can't go wrong with Batman Returns, also on the Super Nintendo. Konami sure know how to make these and make them right. They also brought us Zombies Ate My Neighbors, which has become quite a cult classic, and rightfully so. Rescue your dim-witted neighbors who are completely oblivious to their impending doom. It's not easy, but man is it fun. The PC Engine got Dracula X, Rondo of Blood, which is also easily one of the best games in the Castlevania series. Sadly, this was never released in the West until much later on a PSP compilation, but I remember going down to Joe's and we all played until we got 100% completion. Konami even started to release titles for the Genesis. Not only did we get edgy versions of existing franchises, we also got some new IPs like Rocket Knight Adventure. In this colorful game, you play as a possum with a sword who can charge himself up to ricochet off of walls in his never-ending quest to exterminate the world of pigs. The Genesis also got Castlevania Bloodlines, which, of course, is another solid entry. If you really want a challenge, then they also gave the Genesis a super hard entry into the Contra series called Contra Hardcore. A lot of people prefer this to Contra 3, however, I'm not one of those people. And of course Konami brought a snatcher thanks to one of their employees named Hideo Kojima. This amazing cyberpunk adventure only came out in the US on the Sega CD. If you ever see this game, just take it and ask questions later. It's really no surprise that Konami was a force to be reckoned with on all fronts during this era. Even after the 16-bit era had long ended, Konami was still pumping out some quality titles. The release of Metal Gear Solid on the original PlayStation cemented Hideo Kojima as a game designing god. His popularity went through the roof after millions of copies were sold. Needless to say, the Metal Gear series would keep going on, and for me it peaked with Metal Gear Solid 4 on the PlayStation 3. Kojima was also responsible for Zone of the Enders. These were fast-paced flying mech combat games with an intriguing story. Speaking of gods, how about Koji Igarashi? His release of Castlevania Symphony of the Night put him in the upper echelon of game designers. This was the first Metroidvania game and it breathed new life into the series and is still the best in that style of gameplay. The Metroidvania craze would go on every year or so, usually on the portable systems. Gradius Gaiden on the PlayStation and Gradius 5 on the PS2 were perhaps the best entries in the series. And once again, International Track and Field came back on the PlayStation and believe it or not, my friends and I spent almost as much time playing this as we did Street Fighter. Track and Field was again a button-mashing dream come true. And who could forget about the Silent Hill franchise? 
Konami wasn't afraid of a little survival horror, and the first two games in the series are nothing short of outstanding. I also love what Konami did on the Wii. Contra, Gradius, and Castlevania Rebirth are great games that everyone should play. You could feel that a lot of love went into creating these titles. They really feel like proper sequels to the old series of games and a feeling of nostalgia will definitely kick in when you play them. That is if you were smart enough to download them from the Wii Shop before it died. There are so many fantastic Konami games that I haven't mentioned as it's really hard to include them all, but there's no doubt Konami is amazing. Well, actually not everything is amazing about Konami. Starting in the 32-bit era, the company that I thought could do no wrong started to, well, do wrong. A lot of titles were released that just about ruined franchises. Castlevania Lament of Innocence, Curse of Darkness, Castlevania 64, and the Two Lords of Shadow games have blemished the Castlevania name forever. I know you might not agree with me there, but it's true. Contra Legacy of War and C the Contra Adventure almost ruined that franchise. And of course Konami's and Hideo Kojima's big brawl that they had when making Silent Hills left a sour taste in everyone's mouth. But the thing that ruined everything was when Konami decided to focus primarily on mobile apps and pachinko games. Well, it is what it is, and even though I'm seriously pissed off at Konami right now, I've got to think of their glorious past games. This company has given me years and years of gaming entertainment and memories that I will never forget. Keep the time. Okay, wow, Konami is really amazing. They really are. They are. It's just, they have this huge, just library of awesomeness back through the ages, and I, I love them. But let's hear about Capcom, because, you know, I love Capcom too, but maybe you'll tell me something I don't know. Yeah, Konami is great, but Capcom may just be their equal or even better. Capcom was originally established in June of 1983 and featured a compound name derived from the company Capsule Computers, a subsidiary company that founder Kenzo Sujimoto had run since 1979. Capcom's first games were simple yet charming, as many games in the early to mid-80s tended to be. Volgus here was their first game, which is something we've mentioned before, and it was released to the arcades in the first half of 1984. One of their more popular early arcade titles was an overhead World War II shooter called 1942. This was their fourth game. Curiously, despite being programmed by a Japanese company in Japan, you play as an American on his way to Tokyo to defeat all of the Japanese forces. 1942 also ended up being their first port to a home video game console, the Nintendo Famicom, at the end of 1985. This also ended up being immensely popular and would pave the way to helping Capcom own a large chunk of both the arcade and home markets. Of course, most of Capcom's early hits began in the arcade. Some games, like Ghosts and Goblins, were brought over to the West by companies like Taito. This game was known for its extreme difficulty, something that would become a staple of a few of Capcom's IPs. In fact, its arcade sequel, Ghouls and Ghosts, is one of my personal favorite Capcom arcade games. Hell, it might be one of my favorite games, period. It took the original and improved everything about it, and it also showed us graphics that couldn't quite be matched by home consoles for some time. I even have an arcade PCB of my very own. Yeah, I know, it's actually a Street Fighter II board loaded with Ghouls and Ghosts ROMs, but I don't care. I love this game to death, and it really cemented to me how great Capcom is. Capcom continued to make great arcade games like Strider. This is a game where you played as a weird Japanese ninja trying to infiltrate a bunch of Russians who have conjured up some sort of nasty dude. I'm not sure exactly what the story is, but it doesn't matter. This is a fantastic game. We'd also get a lot of games that we'd never see at home, like the platformer based on the movie Willow. And it's definitely safe to say that Capcom was a big fan of beat-em-ups. Final Fight was a huge hit for them. You could play alone or with a second player if one was around and also wanted to play. Their beat-em-up legacy would continue well into the future with takes on different themes like with Knights of the Round. Is this the same Arthur from the Ghosts and Goblins franchise? Maybe not, but it's great to play a hack and slash style beat-em-up with him and Sir Lancelot. And in 1987, Capcom released a one-on-one -on -one fighting game called Street Fighter. 
It's very tough to control, has some ugly animations, and generally just isn't very fun at all. Now this one wasn't a huge hit, but it is the first game in a series that would transform gaming forever. You've got a lot to run, try again today. <laughs> And that transformation occurred in 1992 when Street Fighter II The World Warrior was released to the arcades. This fighting game was much easier to get into than the first entry, and most arcade goers found it extremely addictive to play. While it could be played by a single player, it heavily promoted playing with two players who would then battle each other. As such, nearly twice as many quarters were going into it per play versus single player and even cooperative multiplayer games which really didn't rely on the second player. This earned both arcade owners and Capcom a lot of money. Most other publishers tried to copy and do their own take on Street Fighter 2, but of course, they just couldn't match what Capcom did. One-on-one -on -one fighting games are still popular today, and it took Capcom to finally do the genre right, as there had been many lesser one-on-one -on -one fighters before Street Fighter 2. Everyone was obsessed with this. It really can't be understated the effect that this game had on the industry. They released many more games in the Street Fighter 2 franchise before moving on to Street Fighter Alpha. This got a couple of sequels before Capcom finally made Street Fighter 3. And as we all know, counting the three can be pretty tough in the gaming industry. They also made other fighting games with different IPs such as Darkstalkers. This one let players be a creature of the night and fight other ghoulish and fun characters. Capcom's arcade history is rich with standout titles, but the home console market would prove to be just as important, if not more so, for Capcom and for gamers themselves. The home market was also very kind to Capcom. Ports of arcade games like Ghosts and Goblins on the NES provided even more difficult gameplay than the arcade original. Beating this one completely was a badge of honor. Often, Capcom would change the game entirely when porting it home. Games like Strider, Willow, and Street Fighter offered completely new gameplay and the only resemblance to the arcade originals was the name. Others, like Bionic Commando, resembled the arcade originals in gameplay but completely changed and improved the stage design as well as the character's abilities. They were also prolific in programming new IPs specifically for the console market like Codename Viper. This is a take on the Rolling Thunder format and it's set in South America. And it's not easy, so don't bother if you're not up to the challenge. Another one that's not as easy as you might think is The Little Mermaid. Most people probably thought that this was aimed solely at young girls inexperienced with video games, but no. It's a fantastic game aimed at everyone and nobody mentions it much anymore. In fact, Capcom handled a lot of Disney franchises on the NES, such as Chippendale, DuckTales, Darkwing Duck, and more. But one of Capcom's most popular new franchises was Mega Man. Although the first game was a sleeper hit, the staff that made it were allowed to develop a sequel, but couldn't do it during normal company hours while they worked on the other games that Capcom wanted them to work on. And Mega Man 2 was a smash hit. It had amazing music, well-designed stages, great bosses, and a challenge that even newcomers could enjoy. It's a franchise that's still going today through thick and thin. There are so many great Capcom games for the 8-bit NES to play, like Little Nemo Dream Master. In this one, you give candy to different monsters to use their powers. Of course, each one can do different things to help you get where you need to be. You knew you were getting quality when you got a Capcom game. Capcom stepped things up in the 16-bit market with great ports of their arcade games like UN Squadron on the Super Nintendo, which is a neat take on the horizontal shooter formula. This one is based on a manga called Area 88, and it's still a fan favorite to this day. Capcom also continued making games based on Disney properties, such as a Super Nintendo version of Aladdin. This was quite the contrast to Sega's version of Aladdin on the Genesis, and most people felt that it was inferior. But it was still a hit, and it gets more love today than it did at the time of its release. There's also Goof Troop, which is a unique puzzle game. This is another game that was a sleeper hit back in the day that's developed somewhat of a cult following. And of course, Capcom brought Mega Man into the 16-bit era with Mega Man X. 
The adventures of the Blue Bomber continue here as Capcom simply could not make enough Mega Man games. This one granted the player new abilities such as wall jumping and more. It also introduced the intro stage where you can become acquainted with Mega Man's new powers. And only after you beat this stage do you get your normal stage select screen. And of course, Capcom created huge waves when they released Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo. The first home cartridge ever with an inconceivably huge 16 Mega Power! This really heated up the 16-bit wars as Sega didn't have a version for the Genesis. Speaking of the Genesis, Capcom was content to simply license their IPs for Sega to reprogram themselves. So the Genesis versions of games like Ghouls and Ghosts, Strider, and Mercs were actually made from the ground up by Sega themselves. But yes, Capcom eventually got out of their comfort zone and started making games for Sega's platform as well, beginning with the 24 Meg Street Fighter II Special Champion Edition. This is a well-playing game for sure with nice music, but the graphics and voices lack in comparison to the Super Nintendo version. Both consoles would see multiple versions of Street Fighter II. Capcom didn't do a whole lot for the Genesis, but they did release a Mega Man compilation called The Wily Wars. It featured the first three games in the series on a single cartridge. It also wasn't as good as it could have been with slightly laggy controls when you start to run and lots of slowdown where there shouldn't have been any. Unfortunately, it never came out physically in the US. They also released The Punisher on the Genesis, which was a port from their arcade game. The Super NES didn't get this beat-em-up. It's surprisingly fun, if a bit repetitive, but at least Capcom gave the Genesis a couple of small exclusives. Of course, once the 32-bit generation came around, Capcom was there to take care of gaming fans. Not only did their one-on-one -on -one fighting games get great ports, especially on the Japanese Saturn, they continued to prove their worthiness as a top third party by developing new IPs. New games like Resident Evil did for the survival horror genre what Street Fighter 2 did for one-on-one -on -one fighting. It was just so creepy, so nerve-wracking, yet at the same time so fascinating. I mean, you had to find ribbons to save your game at the typewriter, but first you had to find a typewriter. Will you be able to survive that long? because there were also limited amounts of ammunition with which to defend yourself from zombie attacks. Oh, and check out our last episode if you want to hear my thoughts on the stellar voice acting. This is another great franchise that's had its ups and downs, but still continues to this day. Ah. This game inspired the creation of other IPs like Dino Crisis. This one played very similar to Resident Evil, but of course with a completely different mission and setting involving dinosaurs. And who the hell doesn't love dinosaurs? You better love dinosaurs. I mean, Jurassic Park was popular back then, so the existence of this game is really no surprise. They even released a slightly upgraded version of this and some of their other PlayStation games on the Sega Dreamcast. Capcom would continue into the generations to come, bringing us memorable titles like Onimusha on the PlayStation 2, where you play as a Japanese samurai. This is another game that had a play style very similar to that of Resident Evil. It's very stylish and lots of fun to play. There are just so many more games to mention, like Okami. Who could forget this game, which is in my opinion basically Capcom's take on the Legend of Zelda style gameplay? Or how about the Devil May Cry series? This one provided lots of fast-paced hack-and-slash style action. Objection! Capcom's also responsible for the Phoenix Wright series, which got its start on the Game Boy Advance in Japan and the Nintendo DS in the West. And this series is criminally underappreciated. Dead Rising on the Xbox 360 showed off Capcom's creativity. In this one, you're a reporter taking pictures in a mall full of zombies to earn points to help level up your character. You can also kill zombies in lots of very, very fun ways. And people absolutely love the Monster Hunter series, but I personally could never get much into it. Don't let me dissuade you from trying it out, though. There really are more fantastic Capcom titles than we could ever mention in a single video. Capcom has one of the strongest catalogs in all of gaming and is definitely one of the top third parties ever. They're still committed to making great games today and I respect them for that. They're not without their faults, no company is. But at least they didn't have a very public breakdown like Konami did. Long live Capcom, I say.
All right, Joe. Yes, Capcom is indeed awesome. And, God, they have so many awesome games. But now is the time. We have to make a decision. I mean, this is it. Yes, indeed. So what's it going to be, Dave? <laughs> you know, on the one hand, Konami has Castlevania, my favorite series ever. Yeah. But on the other hand, Capcom has a huge library of awesome Disney games, Ghouls and Ghosts. Oh, my God. I... You know what? I, I'm sorry. I can't choose a winner. They're both just that awesome to me. They're both right here. I can't choose a winner. So you're going to have to do this, Joe. What is it? Okay, well, Konami is amazing. Capcom is also amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I think Konami has a higher volume of great, fantastic music, which is why we're listening to a Konami tune right now. And, you know, Capcom has good music, too. However, I think Capcom has had more of an impact on the industry with mm -hmm. games like Final Fight. Everyone was into beat-em-ups after that, mm -hmm. even though they weren't the first. Street Fighter II, huge impact on the in industry, especially back in the day. Yeah. Uh, Resident Evil, you know, brought survival horror into the mainstream. Right. So I feel that they both have great libraries. Mm -hmm. Capcom has a library that's just more impactful for, mm -hmm. to the industry. So in my opinion, Capcom wins. Okay. All right, there you have it. According to GameSack, Capcom is the overall winner between these two companies. Now, do you agree with this? Do you not agree with this? What What are your opinions? We got to hear these. It really can go either way, depending on what kind of games you like. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And let us know. And in the meantime, thank you for watching GameSack. What two huge industry influencers are we going to pit head to head next time? That's a good question, Joe. And I was, how about we do uh, Razorsoft and what's that other company? Uh, Culture Brain. Oh, I don't want to appropriate any culture, so I'll take Razorsoft. I mean, they have eight mega death duel, so they've got to be good. All right, all right, I'll do Culture Brain. But so, um, what what games do they make? 